Welcome everybody to our first CCASTD webinar. My name is Sue Weller and I'm the 2012 President of CCASTD. So on behalf of, of our Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome you. This is our second meeting of 2012, but it's our first webinar, so we're really excited that CCASTD is going free for February. So before I turn this over to Ken, who's going to talk to us, about taking your level twos up a notch, learn how to measure application, not just recall. I want to do a couple quick plugs. First off, I want to remind us all that our 2012 theme for CCASTD is to engage, execute, and exceed. And so we're really excited that not only are you engaging with us tonight, but that we're actually being allowed to engage with you. So as we put this theme together, what we really wanted to do is to create these, these learning events where you could go back, network with people, learn a lot, go back to your organization or your group, really engage in what you're doing, execute flawlessly, and then exceed at whatever it is that you set out to do. So um, thank you again for coming tonight. Before I turn it over to Ken, or before I, I do a quick intro, I also wanted to do a, a plug for next, for next month's dinner meeting. Our chapter dinner meetings are always the third Thursday of the month. Next month, we're really excited to have Rebecca Depke from Mondo Learning, who's going to be speaking on defining your virtual impact. Um, I thought that was really appropriate tonight because Ken's going to be um, going to be facilitating virtually for us, so we'll get an opportunity to actually critique Ken's virtual impact. Um, but as we think about how learning is going, so often we are presenting virtually. So whether it's a virtual meeting or a virtual instructor-led course, it's not as easy to connect with our participants anymore or to ensure that our sessions are really engaging. So I think that Rebecca is going to really help us figure out as learning professionals how do we better design our courses and how do we better facilitate so that we are not only engaging but engaging with our audience. So that's my quick plug. The session is on, the session is on March 15th. It's going to be at the Meadows and Rolling Meadows. And we expect that by the end of the week, or I guess that would be tomorrow, so probably by first thing next week, we will have registration up and running on ccastd.org. So having said that, let me turn this over to Ken Phillips. So our, our facilitator today is Ken Phillips. Um, I'm pleased to have known Ken for a number of years. Ken is founder and CEO of Phillips Associates, a consulting company with expertise in performance management, measurement, and evaluation of learning and sales performance individuals. Um, Ken's earned his CPLP credentials in 2006 as part of the Pilot Pioneer um, program that we had, and he recently recertified in 2009. One of the things that I'm really proud of with Ken is Ken is actually a past president of CCASTD. He's been with um, I think he's been on the board for something like nine years, and I was fortunate and privileged to have served under Ken. Ken facilitates regularly for a number of, C of ASTD organizations, and not only did he present at last year's uh, ASTD International Conference, but I think he's facilitated or presented for the last four years on topics related to measurement and evaluated lear evaluating learning. So Ken is truly an expert in the field, and I'm really happy to be um, listening in and learning from Ken. So with that, let me turn this over to Ken, and thank you so much, Ken. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, and uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, session this evening about uh, Take your level twos up a notch and learn how to measure application and not just um, recall. And let me just take a minute to uh, run through the agenda about uh, what we're going to focus on tonight. And the first thing we'll spend a few minutes on is examining some uh, level two evaluation facts. Uh, and these are some facts that were taken from um, an ASTD research study that was uh, published at the end of uh, 2009. And I'll say, uh, a bit more about the research study when we get to the facts themselves, but I think you'll find these uh, facts interesting um, as they relate to level two evaluations. 
the second thing we'll spend time on tonight is uh, understanding and analyzing uh, the critical difference between uh, writing test questions that measure application uh, versus those that uh, measure recall. And uh, talk about the implications of you know, writing those two different types of questions, uh, not only for the learners, but also for our business um, executive stakeholders, and how they may pr uh, perceive the value of the data that we are providing them. Um, and then the last thing that we'll focus on are uh, 15 practical tips that you can use for uh, creating valid, scientifically sound, multiple choice test questions. Um, and eliminate the kinds of test creation errors that people who aren't savvy um, in the art and science of uh, writing test questions typically make um, and uh, cause their uh, evaluations to not be as valid as they uh, could be. So those are the, uh, the three things we'll spend time on. Uh, before we get into the facts, I just wanted to take one minute uh, to just quickly put up the Patrick Phillips evaluation model. And just to be sure we have the same understanding about when we start talking about level two evaluations and what those focus on. But uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the model and know that uh, the uh, Don Kirkpatrick uh, created the first uh, four levels, uh, level one reaction, level two learning, level three behavior, and level four results. And then uh, later on, um, um, Jack Phillips, my namesake, but uh, no relative as far as I know anyway, uh, came up and added uh, level 5 ROI. Uh, and uh, we're going to focus our effort tonight and uh, our learning tonight is going to be on the, uh, the rectangle that's in the orange there is level 2 learning. So the measurement focus at level 2 learning is uh, trying to assess the degree to which participants in our learning programs or our learning events acquired either new knowledge, um, new skills, um, or new attitudes. Um, and the time frame of when we would typically administer or conduct a level two evaluation is anywhere from uh, the conclusion of the program to somewhere out to rough guideline six to eight weeks um, you know, after the program. And I'm going to say more about uh, that time frame and why there might be some advantages to not doing your level two evaluation immediately after the program is over, but really waiting for a while. And I'll talk more about that here in a minute. Uh, in terms of the uh, facts that I mentioned earlier, and uh, this ASTD research study, you can see this, the citation for the research study at the bottom of the slide. Uh, but the, uh, this study was done in, during 2009, published at the end of 2009, uh, and it was a joint study done by AST, ASTD and the Institute for Corporate Productivity, or the acronym that they go by is I, the number four, CP. And um, they did this joint uh, study on the, the kind of the state of measurement and evaluation um, in the workplace learning and performance. Um, industry, and uh, and you can get a copy of the study if you're a national member of ASTD. You can go on the ASTD website um, and uh, actually download a copy for free. Um, if you're not uh, a member of national ASTD, you can purchase it um, or go out and find somebody who is a member and ask them to download it and then ask them if you can borrow it because it will be a lot cheaper that way. Uh, but the two facts that I thought would, would be interesting for you to see uh, that, that uh, will help give some context for what we're going to focus on tonight is the first fact was that they found 81% um, of the organizations that participated in the research study, and there were uh, close to 700 organizations, and they were uh, represented um, a wide a range of sizes from like 100 employees up to multinational. Uh, corporations and also represented um, a wide variety of different industries. And what they found was that 81% of the organizations that responded to this survey evaluate at least some learning programs um, at level two. That probably isn't real surprising um, to many of you or most of you, uh, but I think the second point really is. And what the other thing they found was that uh, only 55% uh, 
of those organizations, of those 81% that do the uh, conduct level two evaluations, only 55% of them view the data that they collect from their level two evaluations as having either high or very high value. Or said differently, 45% of the organizations that do level two uh, do a level two evaluations uh, don't perceive the data they collect to be uh, to have much value. Uh, which raises the interesting question about, you know, why are they doing it if they, um, you know, if they if they're not getting any valuable data? And I think that there's uh, four main reasons for the disconnect here, uh, which I want to talk about. Uh, and uh, and and again, these will help focus the remainder of our presentation this evening. But I think one of the reasons for that big disconnect uh, between the 81% and the 55% is because uh, people realize that the test items that are created and used in many level two knowledge tests are either too simple uh, so that people who are savvy in the, in, the, um, in the art of test taking could figure out what the correct answer to the question is even if they slept through um, your entire learning program or learning event. Uh, they'd still be able to figure out the correct answer. or the other extreme that the test items that are created um, are too difficult or tricky uh, to, to give a fair assessment of you know, what the learner knows um, or doesn't know. And so I think that's one of the reasons for uh, the disconnect. And I think the second reason is, um, and which is again one of the things we'll focus on tonight, is that most test items that are created by folks in our field, unless they're savvy in the art and science of test creation, uh, create um, test questions that focus on recall and not on um, application. And the, the recall is the kind of stuff that um, when you were in school and, and you crammed for a test, um, you know, and you were trying to remember as many things as possible, but then once you took the test, you forgot virtually everything. Uh, and that's what we typically test for when we do level two knowledge tests. It's just simple recall rather than getting into um, application. And we're going to spend more time on that so uh, here in just a second. Third reason for the disconnect is uh, the test is administered too close to the learning event. So this goes back to that time frame that I mentioned I was going to say more about. And one of the things that I think happens when we administer level two uh, knowledge tests at the conclusion of a learning program, and even if people do well, which, you know, assuming it was a good program, they should do well, uh, what happens is if we go to our you know, business executive stakeholder and say, hey, if I got some news for you, uh, you know, when we administered the, uh, this level two knowledge test uh, you know, at the end of the learning program that you wanted me to do for your employees, and uh, here's what we found. We found that 92% you know, of, the, of, the, of your employees who participated in the learning program scored 80% or better um, on this test. Uh, you know, and if you put yourself in the chair or in the seat of the business executive stakeholder, they're probably not all that impressed by that, uh, simply because they wouldn't have sent their employees to your learning program if they didn't think they were going to learn something. So the fact that you're coming to me and telling me that 92% of the people I sent scored 80% or higher right at the end of the learning program isn't all that impressive, because I would have expected that. And so what happens is it starts to, um, to um, minimize your credibility when you come in with that kind of data. And so that's the, one of the reasons that I would strongly recommend if you're going to administer a level two knowledge test is where it's practical and, and where you can get stakeholder buy-in for it is not do it at the conclusion of the learning program, but wait four, five, six, or seven, or eight weeks afterwards when you think the learning curve has started to dip, then administer your level two knowledge test. And then you will accomplish two things. One is you will be able to collect data for evaluation. Data, by the way, which will be more credible because now when you go into your stakeholder and tell them that you administered the knowledge test you know, two months after the learning program, and we still got 92% of the learners scored 80% or higher. Now you're talking, you know, now you're talking some meaningful data. And the other thing that you can do 
is, and the other thing you'll accomplish by administering it to six or eight weeks later, is you can also then use the knowledge test to serve as a source for reinforcement in addition to evaluation. Because by administering that knowledge test, all your learners have to go back and think about all the material that was covered in your learning program and all the things that, uh, you know, that were addressed and topics that were covered in order to try to answer those test questions. So it is a way to reinforce what people uh, what the learners um, had learned um, in the program. So you uh, actually, actually end up doing two things uh, with that one uh, knowledge test. And the last reason for the disconnect, uh, primary reason I think is because oftentimes when we administer level two knowledge test, um, the data is never used. In other words, somebody you know, might glance through and look at the test scores, uh, but it's rare, uh, at least been, that's been my experience in most organizations, uh, where they will collect the data, aggregate the data, and, and conduct trend line analysis to look at you know, what's happening over different groups that have gone through the learning program, and, and to look for trends or to look for red flags in the data. And so um, oftentimes, as I said, what happens, somebody might glance through it, but it's rarely aggregated and rarely used and looked at um, and analyzed to, to get the most from it. So I think those are the four primary reasons for that disconnect. And so then the question is, well, okay, if, so these are the reasons for the di disconnect, then what's the solution or solutions? And I think there's so three. Ken, yes. before we move on to the solution, we've actually got some reaction in the chat room about the four points that you just made on the previous slide. Uh huh. Can we take, some, can we take a quick question? Sure, sure. Paul, are you still off of mute? Do you want to? Uh, can you hear me, Trish? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah, did you want me to, to mention what I put it in the chat? Yes, please. Yeah. Ken, I had um, indicated that um, or asked, posed the question of uh, kind of an application-oriented level two test where, where people are asked to perform uh, certain functions um, rather than respond to true, false, or multiple choice questions. And the test is uh, administered usually three to five days after the, the course in, in order to allow some forgetting to uh, um, phase in. Is, is that kind of testing any more valuable, in your opinion, uh, than um, a short answer or multiple choice test given immediately? Uh, oh yes, I would. Uh, I would say absolutely. Even um, even just you know waiting four or five days is is in my mind increases the credibility that the stakeholders likely to see in the results than if you did it immediately after the program is over. Um, you know, I, I I just think that you know you just will get uh, yeah more credibility uh, by waiting. So yeah, no, that's and 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 having people. Uh, you know, actually apply what they learned it, rather than taking a, you know, a, a, a test, either electronic or pencil and paper, um, is, uh, you know, that, that's even better. Just a, a quick follow-up. And the problem is that generally people do well at that stage of the game. And so it doesn't discriminate very well. There's not a nice bell curve. Um, usually there's a, a group, a, a, the large part of the group um, you know, is, is at the top of the range, and there might be one or two outliers who, who don't do well at all. Uh, but it doesn't discriminate neatly um, high and low performers uh, for, for future reference. Yeah, that, that's interesting. That might be worth, um, you know, doing some um, uh, different, you know, to, to administer that test at different uh, points in time and see if that changes any. Because if it doesn't, that's even stronger evidence for the strength of the learning program. Um, you know, because if you administer at five days and then take a different group and do it at, you know, ten days, if you've got that capability where you could do that, um, you could either begin to see whether or not it starts to discriminate. Um, or whether, in fact, people are continuing to score high, which, again, is just stronger evidence. So I don't know if you've got that, 
you know, if if you've got that ability to be able to do that, if the stakeholder will buy into it and the organization will buy into it, where you can, you know, do some adjustments and uh, and and uh, you know and and test at different uh, points in time. Yeah, and Paul, thanks so much for your participation. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, we'll, yeah, just let me know, Trish. I'm not watching the chat, so I'm I'm counting yeah. on you. <laughs> I will. Uh, I will flag you with the little red wand. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, that's fine. Uh, it, it, it's not that I try to avoid them. It's just uh, I can't. I can hardly walk and chew gum at the same time. So try. And... <laughs> no, you keep going. I got you. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so what? Let's talk about what the solution. Uh, you know, what, what's the solution to to uh, narrowing that gap between the 81% and the 55%? And I think there's three things that we can do. Uh, one of them is to uh, create valid, scientifically sound level two tests that measure application and not just recall. And we'll spend some time talking about that here in just about two minutes. Um, and the other thing is to, if you're going to think about using level two knowledge tests, is to really build them in as part of the learning design and not have them, you know, be done as an afterthought. Um, and then use them for both uh, evaluation and reinforcement. And if you build them into the learning design and you're talking to your stakeholder about, you know, the design of the program and how you're constructing it and what elements you're going to have in it and so forth, and different activities and so on, um, I think you can get uh, you know, their buy-in that, and, and, and that it's a good idea not to do this right at the conclusion of the program, but to wait. Or Paul, in your case, you might do it you know, at different points, even with the same group, um, to see if there's any difference. So you do it at five days with that group and then do it, you know, I don't know, 20 days later or something. And, and, but just to uh, build in some uh, you know some some uh, use of that uh, level two evaluation as part of the design and and get it included in there and get it in the stakeholders' uh, mind that this is just part of the of the learning program and then we'll again be doing two things evaluating it as well as uh, using the uh, knowledge test for reinforcement and then the last solution is. To use the data to do something with it, to aggregate it, to knowledge, to, to uh, you know aggregate the test scores, and begin to look for example, if there are certain topics which don't score high, then that might suggest that that's a, an area in the program that needs you know some boosting up or some uh, or some a different design or whatever it might be. Um, but again, if you don't aggregate all that data and start to look at it over time, you miss you know, seeing those kinds of red flags that might be there for you. Uh, also, to, you know, to demonstrate program value, be able to go into the stakeholder and say, look, we got some news for you, and, you know, and it looks pretty good, um, and here's what's happened, and here's what we measured. We were focusing on application. We weren't focusing on recall. We didn't do it right at the end of the program. We did it you know, either six or eight weeks out, or we did it several times after the learning program at different points in time and so on. And then lastly, we can use that data to improve our test item validity. So uh, you know, it's, uh, writing test items is in some ways like designing a learning program. You know, you give it your best effort, and you try to put together the best program. Same way with developing a knowledge test. You try to develop the best test. and We'll talk about these 15 tips and the kinds of things you can incorporate in there to try to create valid, scientifically sound uh, test items. But you never know for sure until you try it out. So one of the things that you can use is to collect the data and go in and do an item analysis and take a look at the, the response alternatives and see if some of your response alternatives are either being overselected or underselected. Because if they are, then that's probably a sign that it's not a great test question. And um, so you can use this to also improve the, uh, the validity of your test items if you actually you know, use the data. So let's just talk briefly about uh, for creating a knowledge test, um, what are the uh, overall goals that we're trying to accomplish by creating a knowledge test? Uh, one is we're trying to create a test that is fair to the learner. So we're not trying to create um, items that are going to be tricky or are overly difficult uh, to try to stump the learner um, because that's not, uh, that's not being fair to the learner. And yet I've heard people that I've talked to that worked in organizations and you know, in our field, workplace learning and performance folks, 
who they said that they thought that's what they should be doing with their level two knowledge test is to try to stump the learners. And uh, that's not what we should be about when we create knowledge tests. And yet on the other hand, we also want to be uh, fair to the organization. So uh, we want to try to avoid uh, creating test items that people who are savvy um, in the art of test taking could figure out what the correct answer is uh, even if they you know, slept through the entire learning program um, and, or didn't pay attention at all. Um, and you will find that um, uh, in, and we don't purposely build these things in or put these things in that, that give away what the right answers are, but there are a number of things that, that, that people who aren't savvy in this whole test creation area do um, that, that will give away uh, what the correct answer is. And we'll see some of those tonight when we get into the tips. Okay, I, uh, if you've all got the handout, um, I've, uh, you should have been sent that uh, prior to uh, this evening. And what I want to do is just give you a minute or two uh, to look through um, the handout. And if you look at the, the actual sample, um, what I want you to look at is the sample uh, level two multiple choice knowledge test. Um, and you, it'll, you'll see there are 16 um, items. Um, and there's, it's four pages long. And, I mean, what I've done is I've purposely built into this test uh, 12 different test creation errors. I don't expect that you'll be able to find all of them, uh, especially given the length of time I'm going to give you here. Uh, but what I would like you to do is to glance through here, see if there's any things that, you know, that pop up uh, or become up or pop out to you. And then what we'll do is we'll go through this and I'll put up slides that will have items taken from the, this sample test uh, up on the screen and then we'll talk about what's wrong with them. Um, and so if you'll just take a second to, uh, or a minute to look through those 16 items, uh, we'll give you a chance to do that first. And, um, and then we'll start working our way through here. So Ken, I know some people did not uh, receive the handouts ahead of time, didn't receive the handouts ahead of time. Oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, yeah, okay. It, it won't be a complete loss because I'll be putting items up there and you just won't have had a chance to look at them in advance like the people who have the, um, who have the handout. Great. So you're going you're gonna to put them up. So we'll be able to see, everybody will be able to see on the screen in just a few moments. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Not a problem. It, 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 it's not, uh, yeah, having the handout just gave you kind of a little, give you an advanced, uh, advanced notice so you could look through there and see if you could find any of these create, test creation errors that I built into this thing. Excellent. Excellent. So I'm wait another 30 seconds or so. Yeah. So can you repeat? Um, can you repeat what you want them to do in the chat room when they're ready? Um, yes. Uh, when we get in there and I start putting up the items, and I'll tell it, it, it'll uh, it, the title on the slide will say, "What's wrong with this?" And so. Um, what I'll do is then after, after you, when you see one of those, what I'll do is just give you a couple of, of you know, 30 seconds or so to, to see if you can figure out what might be wrong with the uh, test item and then to write in the chat what you think that might be um, if somebody has an idea of what it might be. As I said, some of these are going to be fairly subtle and I would, um, you know, I'd be, I, I would be surprised if you got all of them, although you know, we've got a fairly diverse group and so um, you know, we might we might be able to identify all of them. Excellent. I think we're ready to go. Okay, I think so too. So let's uh, start for this. My first question is, uh, what's one thing that all sixteen multiple choice test questions have in common? Anybody pick anything up? Those of you that had a copy of the of the evaluation ahead of time. Is it that they all have the same amount of distractors? Yeah, that's one thing. That's one thing about them. They that, and they're all about interpersonal communications. That's another thing. 
Excellent. Yeah, Megan and Mike put that in the chat room as well, that all have four options, yep. four alternatives. Yep. Al Alan is saying no B answer. No correct answer, probably is what he means. That could be right, I don't know. Yeah, but... Um, I was going to add, also, um, it, there was nothing included like all the above or, or only A and B or um, none of the above, which are no-nos. Yeah, there's... But I don't think so. Yeah, there's some of those in there. There's all, there's some all the above, none of the above in there. What page? Okay. Uh, let's see. On page uh, two, um, question six. Yeah, number six. Yeah. And page three, question eleven. So, okay, let's. Um, we got a couple of things. It wasn't what I was looking for, but that's all right. We, you, all the things you brought up were spot on. Um, the one thing is that if you looked at all the items, uh, they all tested for knowledge or recall, um, not application. So they tested for the lowest thinking skill level. And for those of you who might be familiar with Bloom's taxonomy of thinking skills, um, these are listed here um, in uh, in their uh, order of most or of least complex to most most complex, um, and so all those test items in that uh, sample evaluation for those of you that had it focused here. They were all focused on knowledge and recall and trying to re you know just remembering facts and figures and and things like that. Um, and so there, as we move up higher in, these, uh, in this taxonomy of thinking skills, in Bloom's taxonomy, where we want to focus our questions where, um, where practical, where possible, is here on application. So can people not only, not, so we don't want to just test whether they you know, can recite facts and figures, and we don't want to just test for understanding, which is comprehension, comprehension, but we want to test for application. Can they take this information and apply it uh, back in a, in, you know, in a uh, uh, you know, realistic job situation? And the reason that we want to do that is because it takes our level two evaluations and pushes them to you know, level 2.5 or level 2.6 or somewhere short of level 3 because we're not actually measuring behavior change when we, do, when we write application-focused test questions. But we are testing whether or not people can apply what they learn back on the job. So it gives us a really strong indication about whether people are likely to apply what they learned back on the job. Now, obviously, there's lots of other work environment things that could come into play and prevent people from applying what they learned. But at least they learned it, and they know how to apply it. And that gives, that gives us some really powerful evidence that we can take to the stakeholder. And we can create knowledge tests that also will test for analysis. Uh, these last two uh, thinking skill levels, synthesis and evaluation, uh, are probably in the kinds of you know, true, false, multiple choice, fill in the blank, matching questions, uh, wouldn't apply and you'd have to use uh, you know, like essay if you were going to use a test like essay or uh, something like that to collect data that would assess those levels. But uh, these, uh, any of the, the, the traditional test question types can be used to test for these uh, first four levels. So, Test creation tip number one, and, and if you want to turn to your, those of you that have the handout, if you turn to, um, turn to page, uh, let me get it here, um, five, you will see um, all these tips will start down here at the bottom of that page, and the other things that I've talked about so far. Uh, are up at the top part of uh, page five, and then it will continue over to um, page uh, six. So test creation tip number one, test for application, not just knowledge or recall. Let me give you a couple of examples so that you have even a more uh, complete understanding of the difference. So here's some examples of some test questions. You know, what, does the, what do the letters TV stand for? Or what is the main function of a TV? And what physical principle is used to display images on a TV? 
And then last, your TV is not working properly. What's the most likely cause of the following set of symptoms? And so clearly the first question is pure recall. What do the letters TV stand for? It's like, you know, what does uh, the, the level one evaluations are also known as, you know, reaction. So it's just testing for recall. What's the main function of a TV? Probably requires a little bit more um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, thinking skills because you now have to come up with the main functions. Although again, that's pretty much recall because it's, you know, is it is it entertainment? Is it educational? You know, or, or whatever. That's the main function. Uh, the third one here, what physical principle is used to display images on a TV? Now we're testing for comprehension. That would be like a comprehension or an understanding question. So they've learned all about TVs, but you know, so what's the physical principle that's used to display images? So do they understand you know, that information well enough to be able to, to answer that question? And then number four is uh, a, an application kind of question. So they'd have to be able to apply this so they know some things are wrong with the TV. They're going in to fix it. Can they figure out what's wrong with it based on these symptoms? And can they you know, use that in a, in a job-related situation? Or to use some examples from our world, here's a typical recall question from workplace learning and performance. You know, what does the letter I in the Addy model stand for? That's pure recall. And that's all that that is. Or do we want to write a test question like this, which is focusing on application? So you send a detailed program design document to a group of SMEs to solicit their feedback, and have incorporated a number of their suggestions into the program design. This is an example of what element in the Addy model? Oh, we've already got a bunch of people answering in the chat room, Ken. Yeah, I see two of Sue and Kim, right? Evaluation, evaluation. Yep. 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 Yes, that is correct. This would be an example of a of a formative evaluation. You may have heard the terms formative and summative. Formative are the evaluations are ones that you do during the design and development of the learning program or learning event. And summative evaluations are evaluations you do after it's implemented. Um, so this would be an example of a, uh, of a formative evaluation. So there's um, on your, in your handout, if you uh, go to uh, page 6 and you, you look at uh, the bottom of page 6, you will see there I've listed some steps for creating application-focused test questions. Writing application-focused test questions is hard work. Uh, and, um, but I've given you some steps there on how to go about that. I've also given you some uh, possible uh, item shelves that you can use to write your, uh, your test item. Um, and, but that, that's there to be uh, as a job aid for you to help you write um, application-focused test questions. Now, you don't have to write, uh, there, there, I'm not, and I don't mean to imply by emphasizing the application piece that, that, that recall or knowledge-based test questions are all bad because they're not all bad. I mean, sometimes you, know, you want to know, does the person know this or don't they? So it's not that they're all bad, but it's if that the preponderance of your test questions are, are only uh, at, at that um, lowest level of recall or, or knowledge. Um, again, it has implications for the credibility of your um, results. And so uh, you will have a much stronger case that you'll be able to make to demonstrate the value of your learning program or learning event if you not only get good scores, but also are able to then show the uh, business executive stakeholder that the kinds of questions you asked weren't just recall, but they really focused in on job application and people know how to apply this stuff back on the job. That's a strong case to make. So now we're going to focus on the 15 tips that I mentioned uh, earlier that I was going to share with you. Actually, one of them, tip one you've already got, so we've got 14 more. Um, and so this was one of the items from, the, uh, uh, from the, that sample evaluation. And so um, 
the correct answer is A in this case. I've indicated that with an asterisk you can see here, and so I put it on the bottom of all the slides so uh, you'll see what the correct answer is. And so does anybody have any idea what's wrong with this one? So I can see, Sue, you've got one idea. Yeah, it's A is much longer. Okay, yeah, you all got that one. So that's Yay! good. Good job. So yes, what you want to do is to, when you write, uh, especially multiple choice test questions, keep the response options equivalent both in length and writing style. Because what typically happens is when we create a, a, a multiple choice test question, because the correct, we know what the correct answer is, we typically have a lot more information about that. So when we write the response alternative, it tends to end up being much longer than the other response alternatives. And the other thing that happens is we tend to write that uh, correct response alternative and so that it sounds more like a definition. So someone who is a savvy test taker, if they don't know the answer, um, but, but they want to guess and increase their chances of getting the correct answer, they will look at the response options. If one of them is much longer than the others, and if it tends to sound more like a definition than the others, they will choose that one, and 99.9% .9 of the time it will be the right answer. So you need to be careful when you write your response alternatives that they are roughly equivalent in length and writing style. Here's number four from your sample evaluation for those of you that have that. And what's wrong with this one? C doesn't sound plausible. Yeah. Okay. Okay, nobody's gotten it yet. So, uh, Grammar Dad, there you go. Maybe you, Paul, I think you might have it. Uh, you got grammar differences. Maybe that's, I think we're probably driving at the same thing, Paul. Uh, yeah, so the problem with this is the question should not reveal the correct answer. And what happens with this item is because it ends in A, a collaborative communication style is also known as A, it can't be C. Or D. or D. So if I don't know the answer, I can just look at this question. I know it's got to be either A or B. So now I'm down to a 50-50 chance of getting the right answer even if I don't know the material. And so what we want to do is avoid writing stems, which is the, the question itself, that give away what the correct answer is. And the way you can do that is just do either rewrite it completely or just do something like this. This is easier. So now you can take it and now it doesn't make any difference whether the response alternative begins with a vowel uh, or it begins with a consonant. Because the way it was before, if it began with a vowel, it wasn't, uh, you know, it, it didn't make sense. It didn't go with the A. So in this case now we've got both uh, vowels and consonants covered. And it's simple. So what's wrong with this one? Funny, yeah. Previously. <laughs> Asking a definition, not about a word. Two are obviously wrong. There you go. There you go. Alan, you're so smart. Um, yeah, the problem with this one is that uh, all the response uh, choices must be plausible. And so if you go back to this, oops, yeah. Go back, oops, not too far. Wait a second. Let me go back here. If you go back to this item, even if you knew nothing, you didn't learn anything, you slept through the whole thing or you were texting or um, eating or whatever you were doing through the whole learning program, you didn't pay attention at all, you would know that arguing and interrupting 
are simply not plausible response alternatives. And so again, now you can eliminate those two, and so now we're down to um, a 50-50 chance of getting the right answer. Are you uh, sure, Ken? You mean arguing and interrupting, not appropriate transitions in a conversation? <laughs> no, generally not. It won't get you where you want to go. All right. Uh, so, um, so you want to make sure all your response options are plausible. And one of the things that, that I've heard people do is they purposely build in um, you know, response alternatives for some questions that aren't plausible because they think it's cute or funny. And that's okay. You can do that. But just be aware that you increase the probability that people are going to be able to figure out what the right answer is, even if they never learned the material, by doing that. Because they will be able to eliminate those response alternatives and know that they're not viable choices. So it's, um, you know, you, I'm not saying never do it, but if you do do it, just realize what you're doing and that you're, um, you're going to affect the validity of, of that uh, particular test item. So what's wrong with this? Number six, for those of you that have the all the above. Right. Uh, so test creation tip number five is avoid use of all the above or none of the above. Uh, the reason for that is because typically when we, when we use that as a response alternative, um, what happens is it's always the right answer. And so people will know that who are savvy test takers. And if they don't see a lot of all the above, none of the above in there, and there's only used infrequently, um, and if they don't know the material, um, chances are that they will guess at all the above, none of the above, because more than likely that will be the correct answer. Um, and I was doing a, a little, uh, there was a little quiz. This was in the, the Sunday. Um, paper and my wife was reading it to me. It was on sports things. And so there was, and I know a fair amount about sports, but, but this, there was this one question and they had, there were about seven or eight questions in the quiz. And so this one question came up and I didn't know the answer to it, but it had um, either all the above or none of the above. I don't remember which one it was, but, it, but that was one of the response alternatives. And I said, I don't know the answer, but I'm guessing that that's what it is. And sure enough, it was. So. Um, the one exception to the all the above, none of the above tip here is if you use all the above and none of the above as response alternatives where it isn't the correct answer, then you can get away with doing it. But what you want to do is avoid using it where it's only the correct answer. So if you're going to use all the above or none of the above, make sure you've got some other test items that have all the above or none of the above where it's not the correct answer. So what's wrong with this one? That's kind of mean. Not. Yep. That's right. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, you know, write questions the same way the material is taught. Remember when we went back to the two overarching goals for creating a knowledge test? One was to be fair to the learner, and one was to be fair to the organization. When we write negatively worded or uh, um, test questions, we're not being fair to the learner uh, because it requires more cognitive um, energy to go and figure out the reverse of things than to figure out the way it was taught. And then the second reason for not writing uh, negatively worded test items is why in the world would you want to reinforce stuff that you don't want people to remember? So don't reinforce stuff you don't want people to remember. Be fair to the learner, fair to the organization when we create these tests. So Ken, I think we've got a question in the room here. Megan, I think you've got a, you've got a good question about always correct. Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? I don't yes. know if you can. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, my, my question then goes back to, um, you know, I'd always heard that it's best practice to never use all of the above or none of the above. correct. When you use it, if you use it as a distractor, then you're going to lead the test taker to purposely choose the incorrect answer because they're so used to it being correct. 
Right. Where is that? Yeah, they, well, I mean, that, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the question is. I mean, I, that, that would agree with your statement that. So, so should it never be used or should it just be used? With caution, I guess that's more what my my question is. I mean, because you said you can use it, but only if you're using it when it's not the right answer. But if it's not, no, the right answer, everyone's going to think. No, no you, yeah, you can you if you're going to use that as a response alternative, just make sure that there are some test questions where all the above or none of the above isn't the correct answer. Um, along with where it is the correct answers, because because the people who are savvy test takers will hone in on any time it's used, they'll think that that's the correct answer, even though they may not know the material. So okay. if you're going to use it, yeah, no. I thought you meant it was okay to just use it as the incorrect. I was confused. No, 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 no. Don't. Yeah, no. That's that's tricking people again. So. Um, Tricking the learners again. So, yeah, my general uh, advice would be stay away from it. Just don't use all the above or none of the above. It's also kind of a lazy way of writing response alternatives, you know, because you only have to really write three. Then, so um, that's uh, that's why I would just shy away from it. But if if you know if, if you want to use it, it's okay. But just make sure that you use it in some cases where it's not the correct answer. Okay. Uh, did we talk? Oh, we didn't talk about that one. Did, yeah, yeah, we did. We talked about my question. Same way the material taught. Don't reinforce stuff you don't want people to remember. Um, so here's another one. This is number nine. What's wrong with this one? Yeah, Megan, you got it. Um, so the tip is include the central idea. And most of the phrasing in the stem, which is the actual question itself, so get out as much information out of the response alternatives and put it in the stem. So another way to rewrite that same question would be this way. So now we've taken a communication technique out of the, all the response alternatives and put it up in the stem, the question. And so now the, the response alternatives are much shorter, much cleaner, much easier to understand. And um, uh, and makes it uh, you know just a better, much better test question. Okay, what's wrong with this one? I'm almost done. Okay. Oops. Be careful, because everybody's off of mute. Yep. Yeah, the, you, several of you pointed out. Write the stem as a question and responses that can finish the question, but don't use fill in the blank with multiple choice. It's okay to use a fill in the blank, uh, have a fill in the blank test question. Uh, we're not talking about those tonight, but I mean those are legitimate test questions. There are some guidelines on how to write good fill in the blank test questions. But the example that we had there was a combination of fill in the blank and uh, also multiple choice. And again, it increases the cognitive load on the learner to try to, you know, when they're going through and just looking at response alternatives and picking those out. Now all of a sudden, I come across this question that's got a blank in it, and then I have to look down at the response alternatives and try to figure out what goes in the blank. Um, and it just increases the cognitive load on the learner. And so you just make it easier on the learners to fill the, to, to take the test. So you know, write your stem as a question, and and then your responses can finish the question, but don't use fill in the blank. So I have to ask, how would you rewrite that question then? Uh, let me go back. So could you say um, something like with report specific observable actions or mm, no? What technique? What technique is you use to report specific observable actions or details in an objective, non-evaluative manner? Okay. Great. So that makes that makes it a, and a question mark. You know, you know your question mark. So what technique is used? And then they've got here are the four response alternatives. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, so you can change all those around. So what's wrong with this one? Sorry. The same words in different order? More than one right answer. Oh, sorry, I misread it at first, okay. Um, Yeah, so we're running out of time, so let me just tell you what's wrong. Um, you want to eliminate excessive verbiage or real irrelevant information from the stem, and it's real easy to get that stuff in there. Um, so if you look at this, this whole first sentence, interpersonal communication is often rendered ineffective due to the presence of communication barriers, isn't needed. So it's, it's, it's just extraneous information. So one of the suggestions that I would have for you is after you've written your test items is find somebody who is pretty good at um, grammar uh, and who doesn't understand, you know, doesn't have the same knowledge about this as you do, have them go through and um, edit your questions and see if there's, you know, extraneous information in some of your um, test questions. So we want to eliminate excessive ver verbiage or irrelevant information so we could rewrite that question this way. So what are the three categories of communication barriers? So we get rid of that whole first sentence. Yeah. Yeah. What's wrong with this one? Robert. Robert might be disappointed, but you're probably right. Duplicate use of percent. <laughs> okay, yeah. This one is a fairly subtle one. So it's when possible, uh, present the response options in some kind of a logical order, such as either chronological, most to least, or alphabetical. Yeah, so there's somebody got it. Mike, you got it. So we want to go back and put these, um, put these in some kind of you know order. So we go you know 50, 60, 75, 90, um, or go you know 90, 75, go down from 90 down to 50. But put them in some logical order. Probably most to least would make most sense here. So 90 percent down to the 50 percent. Um, now you won't be. There will be some, you know, items where that won't come into play at all because there's, you know, not going to be any logical order. But if there is, again, it just uh, reduces the cognitive load on the learner and makes it easier to understand the test question. So here are some additional ones uh, that I want to share with you. That um, you want to spread your correct answers across the A through D response all. If you went through there, if you had the sample test and you went through and you counted, you would find that the A response choice is, um, I think, used, I don't know, maybe seven times, eight times, something like that, whatever it is. It is used far more often as the correct response alternative than any of the others. And that happens naturally when we write test items because typically the first response alternative we write is the correct one. So that becomes A which is okay to do it that way. But after you've done, written your whole test, then what you want to go back and do is to go back through and reorder the correct answers so that they're spread across A through D. So it doesn't, you know, the correct answer isn't always um, A. And so that's, that's, um, an, that's tip number 11. So tip uh, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Um, and these are more common sense ones, but be sure there's only one correct answer. That would be um, if you went back and took your data and did an item analysis and you came up, for example, like with two response alternatives that everybody was choosing, that would suggest nobody was choosing the other two, um, even though one of them might be right, that would suggest that there's probably something wrong with that question and that people somehow are reading in, you know, that this, the second response alternative or this other response alternative is also correct and maybe, you know, given the logic that they might 
present to you, you could you would you would see that how they did that. So that's why you want to make sure there's only one correct answer. Use at least four response alternatives with each item. Uh, that's the other another tip. Uh, make your response op, uh, options mutually exclusive. So don't use ranges, for example, that overlap. Like if we did the, go back to that percentage one we had, you don't want to use like 75 to 90, and you know, and then um, you know, 60 to 75. You want to keep those. You don't want to have any overlaps in any of your response alternatives. Um, and then if you are administering your your uh, knowledge test um, electronically. Uh, one of the things that you can do to, again, for reinforcement purposes, is to use a technique that's called the diminishing response technique. And the diminishing response technique is that after people take your, uh, you take the uh, exam or your test, and they hit submit, and they get their, you know, they get the information about how many correct answers they got, and so on, is to not tell people. Um, is to, to get that information to people, but not tell them what the correct answer is for those questions that they got wrong, but to have them go back and either relook at the material uh, to go back and take the test again, um, or just keep going back and taking the test until they get the correct answer. Because every time they do that, they're you're reinforcing you know the material. You're reinforcing the, the what you taught them in that learning program. So what oftentimes people will do is they give them the correct answer. They know you got this wrong, and here's the correct answer. And so that that then eliminates the learner having to go back and and take a look at that. So last thing is just a quick summary: uh, developing level two multiple choice tests. Uh, which you the goal is to develop tests that are going to be valid. Uh, so we're trying to stick to you know use these uh, employ these tips that we talked about the 15 tips for creating valid. Scientifically sound test items. Uh, we want to be create test items that are fair to the learner, uh, fair to the uh, organization, and also test for application, not um, recall. And the uh, last thing is that I have written a couple of articles. One of them on level one evaluations. That's the first one here, and also one on level two evaluations. And if you are um, interested in those. Uh, you can just uh, send me an email, and I will send them out to you. And here's my here's my email address down here at the bottom of this slide. And just uh, send me an email, and just say please send me the articles, and I'll be happy to to send them off to you. Fabulous, Ken. Then, that was. Uh, are you going to mention Trish the WLPI module, or should I mention that? Yeah, give me one second here. So I know everybody's got to run because dinner's cooking and there are trains to catch. But I just want to let everybody know, I know that some folks did not receive the handout uh, ahead of the, the session. I apologize for that. We'll make sure that we send the handout again in an email. So if we duplicate for some people, uh, my apologies, but just want to make sure that everybody gets the materials. And uh, I do want to talk about the Workplace Learning and Performance Institute, which is called WLPI. And Ken, I know you're actually going to be facilitating the upcoming session for WLPI, uh, the measurement and evaluation, which is a full day of measurement and evaluation on April 14th. Is that right. correct? Cover, yeah, that's correct. And it will cover all five levels of evaluation. So we will, uh, you know, there will be more additional stuff on level two, but we'll go into level one, level three, level four, and level five. Excellent, and that's great. And then something else I want to make sure that everybody knows is that we're going to have the video for this session for the webinar that we've done tonight. And Ken, thank you so much for your time. I see you've got a standing ovation in the chat room, which is lovely. But I'll make sure that the video is posted uh, later on uh, next week, going into next week. And I've just got, uh, as, a, as a last thing as we start to wrap and close here, uh, some more information about the Workplace Learning and Performance Institute otherwise known as WLPI, up on the screen. Again, Ken's session, Measurement and Evaluation on April 14th, will be a full day on all five levels. So Kirkpatrick's four and Jack Phillips you know, ROI, it'll be a full day in April. But that's one of seven sessions that we offer as part of the chapter, as part of the Chicago chapter of ASTD. And uh, so there's some information here up on the screen. We've got information at ccastd.org on WLPI. 
check out uh, uh, some more about that, the details and registration, because you can sign up for the entire series or just take an individual session, whatever it is that you need. Great stuff if you're new to the learning profession. Great stuff if you're studying for the CPLP. Also fabulous for recertification points for those of you who are already CPLP certified. Thanks, everybody. So glad Thanks, you could everybody. join us tonight. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks, Ken. Thank you're you, welcome. Thank you, Chris. Thank you're you so much. Thank you.